might start off tonight by um, speaking about uh, these two worlds. You know, often spoken about um, in the spirit, spiritual traditions. That there's the world of reality, the world of what is, what's arising in every moment. And then there's the world of samsara. And samsara is, is the world we create in our mind based on our conditioning and our experience of the past. And so we all grow up in, in families and in cultures. You know, and these ideas are filled. They fill up our personality, they fill up our minds. And we tend to see life through this lens of, of our past, through this lens of our family and our culture. And when we see life through this world, we, we tend to suffer. And we at least tend to experience life in a limited way. And so today, uh, as we are driving across the desert, coming into Durango from California. And so I was experiencing this huge, vast, open space, this incredible beauty and unity in the fall of life with the, the hugeness of the sky, the clouds, the plants, the road, the car, my family in the car. You know, so that's what's normally referred to as, as reality. It's a non-dual experience, but non-dual it means there's no separation between you and the rest of life. And in that it's just the, the direct moment by moment experience of freedom, of openness, of spaciousness, of beauty, of love, of unity. And at various moments in the drive, I found myself thinking about things that weren't actually present. And so when I start thinking about, you know, paying bills or, you know, coming here tonight and giving this talk, thinking about friends and family or whatever, then all of a sudden I'm in this, this uh, world of illusion because it's actually not present, it's actually not real. And the majority of humanity spends their, almost their entire life in this world of samsara. And they don't experience this direct experience with life, this unity, this openness, this incredible love and beauty. And so to me, the spiritual life has always been about, you know, can we step into the world of reality? Or can we come home to this? Can we step out of our mind, step out of our illusion? And there's, you know, all types of teachings and ways we can do this through meditation, through yoga, through questioning our beliefs, our thoughts, questioning our agendas, our thoughts, our orientation, our, our beliefs. When we begin to question them, they begin to fall apart and we begin to open to this hugeness that's here, this, this vastness that's here, this beauty that's here. And we begin to experience this, this huge unity with life. And in most uh, spiritual t traditions, especially the older traditions, that's where they stop. They stop and you wake up and you experience freedom. And then that's you know, the end of the story. You, know, you become enlightened or whatever. And, and it's, a, it's a huge thing to to even begin to, to break down these barriers of your mind, break down these, these false barriers that we create, these false walls that we create, and begin to experience unity with life. But beyond that unity, there's also a huge dynamic power in this world, a dynamic aspect of God that's that's often not spoken about. You know, in some traditions they speak about it just briefly, but the teaching has always been to kind of keep these teachings secret or have people shy away from them because they're, 
is the fear that if people start thinking that they are one with God, that they'll become, you know, crazy or egomaniacs or whatever. You know, we've all seen you know, different spiritual leaders or cult leaders who have gone off the deep end thinking that they are the next Messiah. But if we, if we look at what our consciousness is, you know, so if we, if we begin to strip down who and what we are, if we take away our culture, if we take away you know, our family conditioning, if we take away our thoughts about who we think we are, and just look at what our, our consciousness is on the most basic level, you notice that there's a fundamental aliveness that's here. I mean, everyone has this. And if we didn't have it, we wouldn't be alive. This is this fundamental quiet, this fundamental aliveness. This is this fundamental power that animates our being. And within this, I think if we really look at it, you know, at somewhere in the Bible, I think it says that we are made in the image and likeness of God. all these spiritual teachings that say we are one with God. And if we begin to, say, strip down our consciousness and try to find that truth within ourselves, we can find you know, that there's a basic awareness and that this awareness of who, that this awareness that we are, it's quiet, it's clear, it's spacious, it's empty. And that's that huge freedom that we experience when we drive across the desert. And oftentimes when we, when we have an experience of this, we, we, the feeling is that we're merging into the hugeness that's here. You know, if you do a long meditation retreat, you might notice yourself merging into the hugeness of all of creation. But what's really happening is we're not merging into anything. We're actually just awakening into who and what we are, what we've always already been. We've always been this quiet, silent, huge aspect of God. There's never been any division between us and her. The, the, the only time there began to be a thought that there was division was when we started to believe that we were this identity that our parents told us we were. You know, I heard this story of this girl who the first thought out of her father's mouth was, that's an ugly baby. And so for the next 18 years of her life, when she lived in her, her dad's house, she grew up with this identity that she was ugly. And so she took that on to be who she was. She believed that to be who she was. And then she experienced pain and she experienced suffering. When we directly experience this hugeness that we are, that identity dies, and we discover that who and what we are is divine, is beautiful, is amazing. And so this is what most of the ancient teachings have kind of steered us towards, is to letting go of these thoughts and these beliefs that we've been given by life and to wake up to this hugeness that we are. And again, that's only one aspect of God. The other aspect of God is that God is this huge creative force in our world. And if you look at, if we look at what God was once upon a time, Imagine God was just this intelligent consciousness and the universe was completely empty, completely blank. And then I imagine at some point God had this thought and out of this thought came galaxies, universes, came the movement of evolution 
came our species, came all the different worlds. You know, just from this, this one thought, you know, came all of life. You know, in the, in the different uh, scriptures, it says it different way, different ways. You know, in Hinduism, it says, you know, the, in the beginning there was the Om. In the Christian tradition, it says in the beginning there was the Word. And that's all there was. But then out of that came another thought, and with that thought came all of creation. And it's an amazing thing what's come. In a sense, we, we have been created out of that. Not only have we been created out of it, we are in no way separate from it. I think oftentimes the way we normally think about it is we think that there's God and then there's us. And that these two things are separate. Like God is this divine power and we are like this, this rock, you know? Or this suffering, you know, like peon or something crazy. And I think I've spent most of my life living in that, in that duality. And spent, you know, many years intensely seeking because, you know, all these different spiritual masters and enlightened beings said, no, you are one with God, you are one with God, you are one with God. But to, but again, to discover that unity, we have to be willing to put down all of our thoughts, our beliefs about ourselves. We have to be willing to put, put down our thoughts, our beliefs, our agendas, our ideas about others so that we can discover this unity consciousness. And so that unity consciousness is what connects all of us. You know, like when I look in the eyes of my dog, I see God. And there's an aliveness in him, a beauty that just pours out of him. I see that he too is one with God. And everyone and everything is one with God. And so that's the that's the silent aspect of God. And it's like the unity consciousness aspect of God. But if we are one with God, we also must be one with the creative principle of God, the creative expression of God. And so one of the things that I've been, been playing with recently is working with this, discovering this within myself and just seeing if there's any, any truth to it that we too are co-creators of reality. And so one, one realization of freedom is the realization that we're one with all of life, that life is perfect just as it is. You know, this tends to be the traditional Buddhist realization, and that life is divine, and that reality is what you see. It's not the craziness that's in your mind. But empowered and empowered realization is that I too am God. And I too co-create reality. And that reality can morph to the way I think about it. You know, a lot of people are, are speaking, especially since the, that movie The Secret came out, that our thoughts create reality. And most people have just taken it to use it as a, another device for their ego to get their desires met. But if we just if we just take the teaching that way, we're missing the huge point that we too are God. You know how crazy is it that if we can have a thought that reality can morph and change? If we have a conscious thought that reality can change. That we can choose our emotions, we can choose our response to life. 
that we can choose what can come into creation. You know, as a, as a therapist, I, I tend to work sometimes with some highly negative individuals. And they might come into my office and want to complain for an hour about how terrible life is. <laughs> And one of the qualities that, that God has is God has this quality of God can think anything into, into creation. You know, hence this world. And the other thing is, is that, or, or put a different way, is, is our thoughts are reflected in reality. And so when we, when we have negative thoughts, we tend to get get to have the experience of a negative life. You know, when we have terrible thoughts about someone, oftentimes the universe will warp, so that's reflected back to us. You know, it's this giant game that God plays. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a silly game. And if we want something, if we think about something, it's reflected back. You know, almost in the sense that, like God would there to be a world with human beings. <laughs> so God put the thought out there, and this is what she got. And God wanted a world of evolution, and so she, she put it out there, and now we have, we have this world of evolution. We're a part of it. So we play the same dance within us because we're one with God. And when we think and ponder about negative things, terrible things, it's reflected back to us. We think about beautiful things, divine things, open things, spacious things, it's reflected back to us. And so this is one of the ways we can play with being God, play with being divine play with co-creating in this world. It's just noticing how reality morphs and changes according to what we think, according to what we feel. And what that does is it, it actually shows us that reality isn't as it seems. It's in no way what it seems like. Because this, we spend our whole lives thinking that this world is real in the sense that it's like solid. Just like when we have thoughts in our mind, you know, like if we have a thought that this person should be president, you know, this person needs to go to jail, or whatever it is we're thinking about. I need this job to be successful. You know, we have these thoughts, and, we, and, and as these thoughts continue to repeat themselves in our mind, we create these, these so-called solid realities. And then when we don't get them, we suffer. And so one of the teachings is to, to discover that the thoughts in our mind, they're not solid. Our thoughts and our beliefs about ourselves are not solid. You know, who and what we are is not this solid thing. You know, I was sitting down at Thanksgiving dinner and the, the grandma at the table was telling me that her whole life she just felt like a little kid. And she just felt the same throughout her whole life. And by that she meant that there's this fundamental consciousness within her. And everyone's nodding their head saying, oh yes, I know that experience. And you know, that part remains the same within us. Just this, just this brilliant, real simple innocence about us. It's about as solid as we get. But then also, the different people at the table were talking about their jobs and what they did. You know, I did this and I do that. We tend to latch onto a career and identity and think that 
that's who we are. It's not really who we are. That's just the identity, the role that we've taken on for this short lifetime. And the more we attach to it, and the more we get beat up by it, the more we limit ourselves. You know, if I attach to being a Democrat, someone's a Republican, and they want to argue with me, you know, then I can have this wonderful experience of suffering. If I just relax into my fundamental innocence, and let the Democrat be the Democrat, and the Republican be the Republican <laughs> without any agenda, there's no suffering yet. And so what we find is as we question our thoughts, that they're not, they're not really real. These worlds that we create in our mind isn't real. And beyond that, this world that we live in, this world of form that we think is real, it, it's actually much more flexible than we ever imagined. You know, I played this game once of just thinking about a certain car, and then I noticed that throughout the next couple of days, I started seeing this car everywhere. You know, we, and we all know this thing of where we can think about a person, and then in a couple seconds, they can call us. You see, reality can morph. But it's not really what it seems. It's not really as solid as it seems. And so when we, when we wake up to this, we realize that, that not only can we be free in the expanded sense, free in like the open sense, free in a unified sense, but we can be free in, in an empowered sense. And by that we can live in this open, vast, spacious freedom and then from this spacious freedom, we can begin to create the kind of life that we want, one that's filled with happiness and joy, that's filled with unity and love. So if we like, if we like. And so one of the things that we have to be willing to do to get from, you know, from one place to the next, is we have to be willing to discount our past. And by discount it, I mean, we have to be willing to not believe that it's true. To not believe that it's the end all. Let's see if I can say that a different way. It's kind of like if we grew up and we had a terrible life, you know, growing up and growing up in a difficult household. We might have this belief, this conditioning that says the world is an unsafe place, the world is a dangerous place, I'm unloved, I'm not lovable, I'm unworthy, whatever it is. We have to be willing to look at those thoughts and say, that's actually not reality. I want to choose and create my own reality. Despite my past experience, and despite what I think, despite how I think the world works, we have to be willing to step into the present moment and say, no, I'm going to choose my experience of reality. I'm going to choose to create happiness in this moment. And what that may look like on a practical level is, oh my God, I'm having a tremendous amount of anger and sadness or rage or whatever. And I'm getting ready just to throw it at someone or on someone. And I'm just going to put that down. And I'm going to look, and look them in the eyes and fall in love with their beauty and their divinity and their openness. And see them as a reflection of myself. We have to be willing to be that, that brave, that courageous. To let go of our past. To not believe in it. To let it die if we want to create a new reality, if we want to create a new life for ourselves. And not that many people want to do that in the moment. <laughs> in the moment, oftentimes, when we're angry, or we're sad, or we're blaming, or we're righteous, or we're 
religious or when we want to get our way. I mean, we're stuck at that. But the invitation here is to wake up and to realize that we're never stuck in anything, that we always have choice. In every moment we have the choice to, to choose to live beyond our past experience, our past interpretation of reality, our past conditioning. It takes someone's supreme courage to say no to the past. You know, in a sense, if we look at someone like Gandhi, who took on the entire British Empire, and he would stand before them, and they'd throw him in jail, and they'd club him, and they'd beat him, and he would choose in every moment how to respond to them. He would choose to meet these people with love. These very people who would, I think they threw him in jail for eight years or twelve years of his life. And he chose every day while he was in jail to wake up and to love the prison guards. And a funny thing happened, they ended up loving him back <laughs> He chose to say no to his mind. And he had the same mind that the rest of us have. And we all have a mind that says, well, if someone's mean to me, I'm going to be mean back. If someone wants to fight with me, I'm going to fight back. That's the human mind. That's how our minds work. That's how we're wired. That's, in fact, your know, evolution has wired them that way so that we'll protect ourselves. But someone like Gandhi has chosen to say no to evolution, or to that level of evolution, to make a huge jump in evolution, and say, I'm going to choose in every moment to love. And so when we see someone like that, we can allow that to inspire us, and to show us that it is possible. If it was possible for them, it's possible for us. Because the same divinity in them, the same divinity in Jesus, and Buddha, and Gandhi, and Martin Luther King, is the same divinity in us. And so if we make a mistake, if we drop the ball, which we will, and our invitation to, is to again, in the next moment, stay open, stay loving, choose love, choose to be the force of love, choose to be the force of peace in every moment. That's our God-given power and God-given right, is our free will. We don't actually have to go with the inertia of our emotional mind, inertia of our thinking mind. We can choose. So it takes a great deal of courage to choose in this way. And as we do, we begin to create new worlds, new paradigms, new models, new reflections of our divinity in this world. And so we can use our God-given manifesting powers to create a world of love, a world of abundance, a world of beauty and unity. Not from some egoic place of getting the needs of our ego met, but as a reflection of our innate divinity and beauty that we are. And so this is our invitation every day. In each moment, can we let go of the past? And can we just step into this present moment? Just from a, a place that's awake, not that from a place that's conditioned. Because if we're just trying to do this from our ego, from our willpower of our mind, it'll never work. It has to come from the goodness and unity the peace and the beauty of our hearts. When it comes from this place, that's what, that's what will be reflected in life. And so it's a funny thing, because this world is an evolutionary world, we're always going to be growing. 
and we're always going to have constant challenges. We will never be perfect. Because one of the one of the things besides the fact that we are God, we are also evolving as God in human form. And so that being said, we have to humble ourselves and just admit that we're always growing, always working. And so that means every day we can renew our intention, our intention to be an accurate reflection of our divinity, of our beauty, of our peace, of our honor. And when the various aspects of our egoic mind come forward, we can see it as not that there's something in us that's wrong, that's bad, not that we are bad or that we are wrong, but we can see it that there's that we too are this huge force of life evolving. That as we evolve, all of humanity evolves. As we evolve, this world evolves. And then it becomes our duty to do our work. It becomes our duty to evolve. To, to love these aspects of ourself that are in pain, that are suffering, that are hurting. And can we meet ourselves with this tenderness, with this peace? And not simply try to transcend it, because that's what most people try to do on the spiritual life, in their spiritual path. They try to just transcend their pain and their suffering and push away their ego. And that works for a little bit. But for there to be true transformation to take place, we have to be willing to meet these parts of ourselves with love, with openness, the way a good mother would meet a child. If there's places within us that are crying, that are hurt, that are sad, can we meet them with the vastness and hugeness of our beauty and unity and love them, allow them to heal, and then in an empowered way choose to create a new life for ourselves. Choose new actions. Choose a new way to respond to life so that we don't continue to spin our wheels and we're doing the same actions, repeating the same things over and over. But can we consciously choose to see love instead of pushing things away, instead of ignoring or denying And as we do this work, we change, we grow, we become embodied, we become deeply divine. And so does our world, and so does the reflection of this beauty in our life come forward more and more in a deeper and more powerful way. And so I'll, I'll offer instructions. Throughout the meditation, but the, the basic idea is, is, is can we discover what we're speaking about here within ourselves? So you're welcome to keep your eyes open or have them closed. And if any of you are thinking about what was said, let's just see if we can just allow the thoughts just to fall into the background. direct experience of our fundamental aliveness. And so what that means is we're going to I'm going to try to feel 
come to notice what it's like just simply to be alive in, a, in the most basic sense. You can let go of any thoughts about meditating and quieting your mind and doing anything perfect or right or stopping thoughts or any of that kind of stuff. And let's just simply notice what it feels like to be us. That's what meditation really is is the discovery of our innate divinity. You may notice just throughout your entire body there's a warmth and a presence complete, it's whole. It's innately good. Despite what our mind has to say, despite what people have told us about ourselves, despite whether we're comfortable or have a busy mind. There's an innate goodness that's just flowing throughout our being. We'll just take a couple minutes to go throughout our body and just notice Of course, if there's any place that's tense or tight, you want to relax that, just let it go. You notice on top of your head, it just feels open and spacious. Maybe notice like a radiance, a descent. Looks like there's a feeling of light descending down into you. Notice this, this radiance in the space we call our head or our mind. It's a very simple radiance. It's also charged with the liveness and divinity. The quickest way not to experience this is to get wrapped up in a bunch of thoughts, to go somewhere else in your mind. If that happens, you see if you can just come back to this, just to your basic felt experience.
release, allow your jaw and your throat. To relax. Like a passageway from your heart, your mind to open and connect. Be a portal or conduit free flowing energy. And your shoulders to relax and drop. Noticing this fundamental lightness throughout your jaw, your throat, your neck, your chest, your shoulders. Your arms, your hands. Warmth, the beauty, and divinity awakening in your heart, radiating throughout your chest. A complete and total goodness. Accepting whatever's here. Whether it's pain from the past, experience of our beauty and unity, and the experience of the universe being recreated in every moment. Everything with love as love. Let our heart and chest to open, front to back, both sides. Experiencing the descent of light from above. Also noticing the scent of light coming up from below through our feet, our calves, our thighs, our pelvis.
So we're fully relaxing, fully letting go. At the same time, fully awakening. to this brilliance, to this hugeness, this vastness. surrendering and letting go, allowing ourselves to be overwhelmed by our own beauty, by our own divinity. We give ourselves full permission to be totally amazed by what we are. To totally experience the depth of our divinity. Of course, if any of us are lost in thought, can we exercise our power and our dominion over our mind? And choose to be fully here in our direct experience of this moment. actively choose to see and experience our beauty and our divinity. Choosing to put down the war, put down the fight, the struggle with what is. Simply wake up to this direct experience of innocence. direct experience of your radiance, its fundamental aliveness.
give yourselves permission. Fall in love with yourself. With your perfection. With your simplicity. Simultaneously, making room and space for your humanity. For your limited self, your humanness. Doing love and accept that as well. Parts of us that have hopes and fears and struggles. That fight and argue with life. gentle with our evolutionary form. Meeting it with love and compassion. Self. Can we meet it with love and forgiveness? As we see our struggles, our hopes, our fear, fears, our challenges, we forgive ourselves and simultaneously forgive others, forgive those around us for their humanity. If we're going to be honest, it's simply a reflection of our humanity. We are all one. This oneness, there's different, there's different reflections and stages of growth, stages of humanity. Can we forgive ourselves?
and in an active way we choose to forgive others. We choose to see our beauty. And can we choose to see the beauty and divinity of others? We choose to put down our conditioning, our past, and see this moment as fresh, alive, vast, and beautiful. Again, if there's any aspect of ourselves struggling or in pain, can we actively choose to meet it with love, with openness, with unity, with acceptance? Any aspect of ourselves this morning, this moment to be different, our life to be different, to complain. Can we choose to meet this moment with gratitude, love? acceptance we choose to see our good and the good of this world
choose to be overwhelmingly thankful and grateful. With the unity of wonder. Spaciousness and openness of this moment. In the last few minutes, see if we can give ourselves full, total permission. Simply to let go. to the hugeness and vastness of our divinity.
just gently bring your hands to your heart and bow your hands. <coughs> 